Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, we start our own sizzle season. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I'm joined, as I'm always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about the news from the week, including the sizzle season coming to Splatoon 3. And that's it, because this is Thursday. Uh, Normally, I'd be queuing up the topic episode, but it already happened. Mark, in the meantime, meantime... This changing these days here has messed us up. It is really <laughs> it is thrown off like my like internal clock. Yeah. I woke up way too early this morning, and I think it's because we flip flopped news and topic. I think that's I think that's right. I also woke up early this morning and was like, "Well, got to play Tears of the Kingdom." <laughs> so I got in like an hour before I got ready for work, <laughs> and I have no regrets about it, Mark. Yeah, man. Um. Uh, always on my mind. Yeah. Um, and al- also always on my mind, our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Nintendo Cartridge Society. Uh, things are happening there right now, Mark. We are approaching the end of our first mini series, which you can get if you subscribe at the 8-bit or 16-bit levels, um, NCS Detective Club. We are now free to announce that we are going to be doing a Columbo episode um, for the, the finale. And then... Then in July, we are going to be kicking off NCS Goes Broadway, uh, where we'll be talking about uh, Tony Award winning musicals. Uh, And I got to say, I was perusing a list of uh, Tony Award winners and Tony Award losers, and I was like, oh, there's a lot of good musicals we're not going to cover. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> but there are also a lot of great ones that we are going to cover. Mm-hmm. I'm very, Should be a lot of fun. I it, think it'll be a yes. lot of fun. Um, and we're going to try to approach those like broad and in a way that uh, is not not just for the musical theater obsessives. Absolutely. Um, which, you know, you and I are both like fans of musical theater, but I, I wouldn't say that we are necessarily like the obsessives. Totally. Uh, but it'll be a fun show. Uh, check us out there if that is interesting to you. That's right. Um, and thank you to our new patron and Edward Landis. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who is uh, subscribing at any level. We appreciate uh, you for doing that. Also, you should get in our Discord if you haven't already gotten in there. People are having good conversations about Nintendo stuff all the time in there, um, including their experiences in the new Zelda game. So uh, email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail.com and we will send you an invitation. You can get in there and be having those great conversations with everyone. Uh, all right, Mark, let's get into what we've been playing this week. <laughs> Tetris 99 ticket update. Oh, man, I'm choking. Oh, well, wait, did you have a plan? or No, no, no. no. I just yeah. feel like, uh, um, you know, I'm trying to switch it up every week, give it like a little right. um, theme song. But the first thing that came to mind was the theme song I'd already done. So uh, Just the normal? Da, 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 no, da, da, no, it wasn't da, da. even going to be oh, that oh, one. Oh, okay. This has gone on too long already. Consider right. this the theme song. For this week's Tetris 99. Well, a, di- update. a disappointing uh, theme song for a disappointing <laughs> ticket update. I currently have 777 tic- tickets in Tetris 99. My goal, of course, is 999. So there's like a nice, you know, like symmetrical number mm-hmm. thing happening there. Um, last week, and mind you, this was now nine days ago because we're recording the news episode later this week, uh, I had 768. So I've only gotten. Uh, what nine tickets? It's so hard for me to like say anything about this though, uh, other than congratulations because <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom just came out. Tears of the Kingdom just came like, out. It, what it am I sense. supposed to do? Right now, if yes. Nintendo had done a Tears of the Kingdom, um, Tetris ninety nine Maximus Cup, here's on the, the thing. Same weekend, I would have just gone in yeah, for one know. day and gotten yeah. those four tickets. And yeah, that you're been right. It. You're right. So, I mean, it is also curious. Like, why nine? 
What does that mean? Does that mean I like got two four days, <laughs> two four ticket days, and then went in and got one ticket and then bounced? Yeah, some things about Tetris ninety nine ticket update are just going to be unknowable. Yeah, and uh, I think we've all learned to accept that. Mark, I'm not giving up on this goal. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think you were. I just, I just, <laughs> I just want it known that I'm not giving up on the goal. Okay. Because it really sounded like there was a but coming at the <laughs> end did. of that. It did, and I just that's and that's all I wanted to communicate. Is okay. that I'm saying I'm not giving up on this. And you're a man of your word. And I'm a man of my word. Uh, there is a silent but in there. And the silent but is maybe it takes me longer to <laughs> maybe do. Maybe not by summer. Maybe maybe not by summer. Maybe not by the original timeline. <sighs> Otherwise, we've been playing The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, we have a whole episode where we have spoken about it at length. Um, but Mark, do you have any like fresh observations or like new experiences in there that you would like to talk about? I feel like um, one thing we should probably figure out, and we haven't talked about this at all, is um, how do we want to handle kind of like spoilers? Because there is stuff like right. in these what are we playing segments, because right. there is something I could talk about that I am uh, that I experienced after we recorded. Uh, Tuesday's episode, but I don't know like how much to talk about in detail. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean I think we should probably just not for a while. Right? Okay. Like I think we we need to uh you know uh just like provide each other updates on like how we feel it's progressing. Um, but like kind of until we have a moment where we like set aside time to talk about Tears of the Kingdom. Like we may do another like Tears of the Kingdom uh like impressions update whatever yeah. um in a couple weeks. But I think I think that has to be something that people opt into. I think right? so too. So I um there is something spoiler free that uh I would like to ask you about. Mm. Does it it's does it feel to you that the like rupee economy in the game is stingier than Breath of the Wild? Like I feel like rupees are fairly hard to come by like what in the wild yes yes i i i do agree with that i remember them being sort of hard to come by in the original game too though i felt like i was and maybe it's because i have totally in tears of the kingdom like almost completely avoided random con or not random but like encounters with bokoblins in hyrule field yeah but that's that's not like, really how you get rupees though is from feel, killing guys but see not by killing them but a lot of times in their hideouts they have uh, yeah, you know at their forts or you know just their little encampments they have uh chests that you can open after you wipe them yeah. out and a lot of times those had rupees but basically and one thing that i thought was interesting and made me think like oh was this a conscious choice to um like make rupees harder scarcer in Bre in tears of the kingdom is i was talking to an npc at a shop like a shopkeeper and they were basically saying they were like you should go to caves and get um like right get the like, precious stones get the precious sell stones those. and yeah. then like sell those to me so you can afford this stuff right i'm not even close to being able to afford like the outfits that are in the stores yeah and stuff. totally and so that's the part that made me like yeah, I don't know. It just feels like they, and maybe it is the way I'm playing, that I'm avoiding some of, like, the areas I could get rupees easier. But I, like, I think I have right now maybe 350 rupees, and that's, I haven't spent any rupees. That's, like, everything I've gathered in my, like, oh, 15 yeah. hours of play. Yeah, that's interesting. I've definitely gotten more rupees than that and spent more rupees than that. Um but like, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it is, it is tricky. Like, a, a, a rupee doesn't go very far. Um and you know maybe it's maybe it's the supply chain or <laughs> yeah that's right that's probably what it is covid also hit uh high rule yeah that i mean that well i mean you have a calamity that's true you know that's got that's got to be hard to bounce back from no, there's no vaccine for ganon <laughs> you just you just got over a calamity and then something else is happening that's, I mean, give these people a break. I mean, gloom is just a uh, calamity variant that's yeah. all that is <laughs> um but no i uh I, I just, I, I love this game, and I hate now that we are in the work week, right? <laughs> oh, oh, the cruelest blow, for it, sure. It is, because the weekend, you know, I had, like, other responsibilities and stuff, but largely I was like, if I want to just, like, play this game for a couple hours today, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, I don't have that time. Yeah, no, completely. Um, so, but after, after you leave tonight, I'm going to, I'm going to hop back in. And I mean, I'm, I, so I, I completed the, uh, the, the wind temple on um uh sunday evening 
uh, and then didn't get to play it all on on. Jeez, did I not play it all on Monday? Not play it all on Tuesday, and just played a little bit this morning. Um, just having a fun time, like running around like that that area, um, and just sort of like picking up shrines and uh, seeing stuff. I love that this game has that same like. You see, you as you're running around, you're always going to see something interesting and like want to chase it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, the world design in this game is uh, second to none uh, and is on par with Breath of the Wild. So, um, all right, I don't think we have anything else to say about what we've been playing this week. So maybe we get into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. <laughs> Well, hopping back to Tuesday when uh, our like uh, breath or Tears of the Kingdom episode came out, uh, the Super Mario Brothers movie is now on digital VOD, which is uh, was surprising to me to find out that it was coming to uh, digital release so quickly. Me too. Me as well. I mean, I it made a ton of money in theaters, uh-huh. but it was still only there for like a of, month. It's still making a ton. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like still making a ton of money in theaters. Um. It was like the number two movie behind uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three this past weekend. We got we got Chris Pratt in positions one and two. (laughs) I didn't even. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. Here, okay. I think we look. He can still have. He can still have like his weird, like you know, personal beliefs that like we don't like. But I think we may owe the performer Chris Pratt an apology (laughs) because. He's also great. He okay. I think he's fine as Mario, right? I've got no complaints about him as as Mario. I think he's genuinely amazing in Guardians Volume Three, and I'm not like a, a Peter Quill like uh, defender or apologist or whatever. I think he's fine in the role normally. In Volume Three, he's like genuinely great, and I had moments where I was like, "Wait a minute, is Peter Quill hot? <laughs> like, do I love this character?" Whoa! Throwback to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume One. Kinda. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so like I, I had a real moment of like, do we owe at least the performer persona Chris Pratt an apology? I think that, and it's really interesting. We're gonna go on a little Guardians of the Galaxy tangent, go. a little Star Lord tangent. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. Like, if you you are James Gunn, you have no control over what the characters do or say in the Marvel movies that they appear in that are not like, um, you know, like James Gunn pen. Like maybe you have a certain amount of input. Well, the 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 like the going reporting was that he was writing the dialogue for them in the Avengers movies that they appear in. Really, I thought even though he wasn't like working for Disney at the time because they had fired him. Interesting. Okay, so maybe you do because uh, what I uh, so maybe what I'm about to say is complete nonsense. Well, but I don't I don't think it will be. But so uh, but say, basically say what you're going to say. say is like I feel like uh, his. Like, Star-Lord in the Avengers movies plays a very specific role, Mm -hmm. which um, is, I find, like, annoying and not very good. Like, I don't like Star-Lord in the Avengers, in, like, the move, in the non-Guardians of the Galaxy's movies that he appears in. Which is really just Infinity War. Because he's in Endgame, but, like, just for that final fight at the end. Right. And he's in uh, Thor, uh, Love and Thunder. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Um... Yeah, yeah, that 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 is a good point. But like the uh the thing that I thought you were going to drive to is that like, you know, not only do like the characters have to like uh say things that you wouldn't necessarily have them say, but like you can be writing this like massive uh story about like the relationship between Peter Quill and Gamora and then kill off Gamora. <laughs> Someone else kills off Gamora and right. then you just got to deal with the fact that there's like another version of that character and Volume 3 does a really great job of like addressing that and not being like cheap about it. Um really really doing the thing that I wanted from uh the Rise of Skywalker and just like acknowledging even like difficult storytelling choices that you're like this wouldn't have been part of my vision but I'm going to take seriously everything uh-huh. that came before it and uh, like honor that um Guardians Volume 3 effectively does do all of that in like really impressive ways oh that's really exciting I haven't seen it yet but I'm really excited to see it uh, all of this is to say <laughs> that you can watch the Super Mario Brothers movie at home now if you yeah, want that's right um but like why, why do you think they did I mean because you I, I assume they're not taking it out of theaters. I assume right now, like this weekend, you could either watch it at home or go to the theater and see it. Yeah, I think that it's uh, that they're just on a set schedule where it's like six weeks or whatever after it's released. You know, it's we're contract we're contractually able 
to put it on digital VOD. So even though um, it's still doing really well in theaters, like that is just the machine is operating in this way. And like yeah. once the machine was put into action. I you- mean, do you think that that like belies that they were like not confident that it was going to like be I so don't, successful or I like- don't think so I think it's just the I think the um like I mean maybe they were hedging their bets but I also think that just in general that window between um movies being released and being available like digitally and it, then it is, like streaming, it is way like, shorter just really yeah. like small um it, it it is really small but like this is very small right like yeah, six weeks Six weeks, it, it, not not very long at all. I feel like it, at least like the uh, the Marvel movies, it's like three months or something. Yeah, which is really not that much longer than six weeks. So uh, what what am I saying? I mean, it's close. You know, it's it's pretty close. It's double. It's double. Um, and then on f- tomorrow, uh, May nineteenth, Lego Two K Drive is released. This is the Lego racing game that kind of like uh was a surprise announcement not that long ago. And is uh, now being released on Switch and basically every other platform. Uh, which sounds cool. Is that something that you are interested in uh, looking into when it comes out? I only out? have time. I only That's have time. Too, I mean, what a great point. Right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for anything releasing in its wake in my life. Yeah, time and room in my heart, really. For sure. Um, oh, you know, I didn't mention this in uh, what we've been playing, but I meant to. Um, it's not something that I've played so much. It's something that I picked up on a recent sale, um, which... I believe is probably a mistake that I made, but I did it anyway. Um, you know all those uh, Aspire um, Star Wars oh, yeah. games? Um, so they were all on sale for a little bit, and including a bundle that had all seven of these games together for um, like 40 bucks. Um, and I was like, oh, what the heck? So I bought Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Knights of the Old Republic 2, Star Wars Racer, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast, Star Wars Republic Commando, Jedi uh Jedi Knight Jedi Academy and Star Wars the Force Force Unleashed all for 40 bucks. Amazing. Like last week. Um and I had a bunch of like uh money still on my uh Switch and I used points so I think I spent 8 bucks. That's and was just like there we go. Yeah, that seems like a great deal. Um and who do will I ever turn any of those on? I don't know. But I could. <laughs> Mark, I could. If anyone uh, out there wants to direct me to play one of those games first, um, uh, you could try it. Email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail.com, or get in the Discord and tell me there. Um, all right, Mark, let's close out the new releases. Which brings us, oop. <laughs> which brings us to a regular segment on our show. It is time for 4:33. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 4:33, wherein a performer or a group of performers didn't play their instruments for four minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So, for the duration of one performance, 4:33, Mark and I'll talk about something not at all Nintendo related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Mark, you want to set this up? Yeah. So, actually, in the Discord today, there was some talk about the uh, the Goosebumps book book series. I mm-hmm. think uh, dis- some discussion about the Five Nights at Freddy's series kind of like dovetailed into this. Yes. And uh, listener and friend of the show, Alana, suggested that we do a 4:33 where we. Try to guess the premise of Goosebumps books based on their title. Sure. Uh, so we've got a list of Goosebumps books uh, by title with no description, and then we're going to pop on over to uh, a, a resource that does have a description to see to verify that we have figured this out. And I, uh, what is? Did you read Goosebumps books? No. Oh, okay. I did not read a, a single one. Uh, I, I was not a bi- outside of Tolkien was not a big reader growing up. Got it. I did read uh, Goosebumps books, but oh. I cannot remember. Um, I remember some of these titles, but I don't really remember the premises of. I think uh, of a lot of them. Although I think based on the title, some of them are self-evident, like Night of the Living Dummy. I, mean, I think we could that's probably that, that's the marionette one, right? Or not marionette, but like a dummy. The ventriloquist like, dummy. Ventrilo- yeah. dummy. Uh huh. Um, all right. Well, how do you want to approach this? Because we have a, a, a you know number one through sixty-two. Let's go in order. Okay. Uh, starting with "Welcome to Dead House." Ooh, "Welcome to Dead House" to me that that's like a poltergeist thing, right? Where like the house wants to eat you. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'm gonna yes, I'm gonna guess that uh, it's like a, a family. 
maybe some kids that move into a new neighborhood Mm -hmm. and their house wants to eat them. Uh, Amanda and Josh think the old house they've just moved into is weird, spooky, possibly haunted. I think we nailed it. (laughs) Uh, Okay, great. Next is stay out of the basement. I'm going to say there's a monster in the basement. I'm, I'm going to say that too. And I'm going to guess that I, I'm just, I'm picturing that title and I can see that like green hand. I think this is the one with the green hand. So I think it's a swamp thing that's down there. Dr. Brewer is doing a little plant testing in his basement. Harmless, there we go. He says, oh, there you go. Yep. Nailed yep. it. Swamp thing in the basement. Okay. Monster blood. Ooh. I, maybe it's a werewolf type thing. See, I or was, thi- bat. Like I, I was thinking it's like a turned into a bat. There's like a new energy drink going around school. <laughs> Turns out it's monster blood. Turns well, the kids into monsters. Yes. So I, I don't think... Uh, 1992 is a little early uh, for I think it's a little early drinks. for energy drinks, um, which is wild that there was a world before energy drinks, <laughs> but it did exist. <laughs> it did exist, kids. <laughs> uh, while staying with their weird great aunt, uh, Catherine Evan visits a funky old toy store and buys a dusty can of monster blood. It's fun to play with at first. Uh, okay, so that's it. It's like a, a toy that then... Uh, like comes to light or like uh, a play-doh substance that comes to got it uh okay okay what's next next? is say cheese and die and this one i do remember first of all great title great title second of all it's a haunted camera you like take a picture and um the the polaroid comes out or whatever and it looks different Mm. than what how you look and then that will happen i think think so i can't remember that part okay well you remember the premise so we're not even going to look it up okay the curse of the mummy's tomb i'm going to say this one is about a curse of, on a mummy's tomb uh yep christmas in egypt <laughs> uh let's get invisible i think we can probably guess this one as well yeah that like you probably pick up something at a joke shop that turns you invisible a, a mirror in the attic okay uh-huh. all right uh, next is neither living dummy we already uh, talked about that one the girl who cried monster Hmm. Maybe it's like a girl who there's a monster living in her closet, but nobody believes her. It's got because it's got to just be the boy who cried wolf. Yeah, right? let's uh, see. Yeah, let's find it. Lucy, Lucy likes mm-hmm. tormenting her younger brother into thinking monsters are real until she learns that her l- librarian, Mister Mortman, is one. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good, and we were pretty close. Um, all right, next up is Welcome to Camp Nightmare. I mean, just just, summer camp. Just a summer camp where scary things happen. Uh Uh-huh. The food isn't great. The counselors are a little strange. The camp director, Uncle Al, seems sort of demented. (laughs) Okay, so Billy can handle all that. But then his fellow campers start to disappear. What's going on? Why won't his parents answer his letters? What's lurking out there after dark? Camp Night Moon (laughs) is turning into Camp Nightmare. Oh, very good. Uh, Very good. Very good. Uh, I... Oh, you know what? Our recording of 4.33 has ended, so we have to stop there. (laughs) Uh, We were accompanied today by Lord of the Lost. Mark, let's get into the news. Sizzle season 2023 is coming to Splatoon 3 on June 1st. How will you be celebrating sizzle season this year? Walking around shirtless yep, everywhere I can. Me too. <laughs> if it doesn't have a sign that says no shirt, no shoes, no service, I'm not wearing a shirt. I mean, I got, you know, I don't need service everywhere I go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Self-checkout? I don't need service. <laughs> I'll do it myself. <laughs> I won't be wearing a shirt while I do it. Uh, shoes, though. I mean, I'm not going to walk around I, the CVS myself, without yeah, shoes that, on. Yeah. I'm doing that for myself, yeah. though. Uh, the latest season brings new stages, weapons, and a couple of new and some new modes, including Barnacle and Dime is a new stage for Turf War. Uh, the Humpback Pump track returns as a new to Splatoon three stage. Uh, so that's uh it has appeared in a, a previous game. I don't remember Humpback Pump track, um, but I do love to say it. Yes, it's very good. Also, the Pain Brush is a new weapon, and also. It's a good name. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great name. I, I, I love Pain Brush. And then S-Blast 92, which is also a new weapon, which is clearly based on the Super Scope for the SNES. Yeah, and it's not even really so much. I, I wrote that it's, that it's based on it, but like it clearly just 
is the super scope, <laughs> but it shoots paint, which I know the super scope didn't do. <laughs> um, but very cool. Did you own a super scope? No, hell, never, I didn't either. Did. Especially after having like the zapper and having that be such an integral part of the NES. I mean, the zapper is an iconic like part of the uh, like early NES experience. Duck Hunt is like a top ten NES game. There is no, I mean, first there's of all, no Super Duck Hunt. There's no Super Duck Hunt, and there, there's really just Super Scope Six and Yoshi Safari that use the Super Scope. Um, and I don't like no one ever talks about those games or those experiences. There are good Zapper experiences on the uh, NES. There's also going to be a new stage for Salmon Run, which is always great news for me. The Jammin Salmon Junction is the new stage. Another great name. They write some good names <laughs> for this game. Also, uh, uh, sorry, keep, keep going. I was just going to say, there's also new cards for Table Turf War, some, of course, new catalog items, and then some new talent challenges, like uh, Too Many Trizukas, Foggy Nation, and Extreme Jump Battle. Um, did you get the uh, a chance to watch the trailer for this? No, I haven't yet. Because um, the music is kicking. Can I? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so it's like an old school ska bop. Hold on. This is starting to play the trailer here. I'm skipping it. Splatoon is just good. Uh, yeah, man. What a great, like, world. Yeah. Um, so this all comes out on June 1st. Yep, that's right. So not that long from now. Uh, will you be jumping back in? I mean, you got to check on this split, uh, the Salmon Run thing, right? Yes, yeah. It's been a while since I've played Salmon Run, and uh, this seems like a good enough reason to get in, uh, for sure. In its, fr its first weekend, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has sold over 10 million copies, according to Nintendo. Which is a number so big, I kind of didn't believe it when I saw the tweet this morning. Yeah, to put it in context, the last official number that we have for Breath of the Wild, which is from uh, as of March 31st, 2023, is 29.81 million units. So Tears of the Kingdom has done over a third of that in In the days. first 72 hours, yeah. Um, do you think that, like, you know, Breath of the Wild, um, do you think Tears of the Kingdom can match Breath of the Wild sales, or do you think it'll be more front-loaded? Because Breath of the Wild has had, you know, like, seven years of evergreen, right. you know, like, month after month right. selling to reach uh, that almost 30 million milestone. And it launched on a console with a much smaller install base in that it launched simultaneously <laughs> right, <laughs> with, uh, with the Switch. And it was, and on was the also Wii U. on the Wii U. <laughs> Didn't do it many favors. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, I do... I do wonder, it's impossible to know while we're in it, right? But, right. like, what are what is the legacy of this game? What are the legacy of these two games um, 10 years from now? Uh, and, like, has Tears of the Kingdom, like, outstripped it by then? I, I, I still feel like, I mean, I know there are people that have beaten the game already and whatever, but I still it still feels like that we as a collective, uh, we're not to the place where we're like, yeah, we're done with... We're not, we don't know everything about this game totally. yet. Totally. Um, and so, you know, whether it is uh, a better game than Breath of the Wild is like still a, uh, I mean, it almost feels like a, a conversation that people don't truly want to have. They're just like, both these games are uh, incredible, right? And it does feel, I mean, this is coming from a podcast that ranked like Breath of the Wild, the best Zelda game. Of all time, like yes. uh, six weeks after it was released or something yes. like that. I don't know. We but, were right to do so. <laughs> we were right to do so. But um, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's just kind of like too, like you're saying, just too early yeah. to really be able to reckon with it. Although this is reminding me that at some point in the future, once we finish Tears of the Kingdom, we're going to have to do a new definitive ranking of the Zelda series. Yeah. Because there's a new entry to include in there. Uh, and an another like contender for number one. I am. Too, so crazy which is just mind-boggling yeah um but yeah it's a it's a it's also just like crazy to consider what like this new flavor of zelda means for like the series position uh you know like in the, the nintendo stable right because like tears of the kingdom is only the second zelda game to sell more than 10 million copies ever and it did it in the first 72 hours, right? Like, it's just Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom that are in this, like, upper stratosphere of, like, high-selling games um, 
that like that that's where like Pokemon lives. That's where like uh 2D Mario lives. That's where Animal Crossing lives now. Um and it's just it's just crazy that that's not where the series has always been. No, I mean the series has always been critically high well regarded yep. and you know ha- uh, obviously been a big part of Nintendo's legacy, but yeah, like Ocarina of Time sold 6 million copy which is nothing to sniff at but you know like right. i think twilight princess before uh breath of the wild was the best selling zelda game and it like you said topped out at around um 10 million and it had the benefit of being a wii launch title right and so yeah like zelda i've, I've got 8.85 million on the the chart i'm looking at right now yeah for, for twilight I, princess and so i um uh yeah it is just weird to think that uh the ceiling has just been like blown off what a Zelda yeah. game can be. And, and you know, we'll, we have a yeah. quote coming up here from uh, Aonuma, the series producer, talking about how, yeah, this is kind of like, just like Ocarina of Time was the template for Zelda for a while. Like, this feels like this will be the this is template, template for Zelda yeah. going forward. And it's like, yeah, like, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and like, we love it, too. <laughs> what, what's so, uh, like, fascinating about um, the success of this game, both in terms of, like, how good it is and how much it's selling, is, um, you know, uh, I th- there's been a lot of uh, sort of um, digital ink spilled about the current state of Xbox and, like, Microsoft games. Um, especially uh, in light of uh, Redfall coming out a couple weeks ago and not uh, being super great, and then kind of just being like, all of our hopes are now pinned to Starfield, and it better be uh, incredible. Um, but one of the like uh, opinions expressed by um, Phil Spencer um, was this idea that um, you know, even if Microsoft puts out like the greatest game ever made tomorrow, that doesn't turn around um, the position that they're in, which is true but you have to start doing that at some point right and like to know to to see tears of the kingdom come out and like register as one of the best games ever uh it's like oh yeah that's just another notch in nintendo's belt they can put that up against super mario odyssey they can put it up against breath of the wild they can put it up against uh animal crossing uh new horizons and be like he, he, we we have this like you can come to, you can trust us to eventually put out the best games ever made yeah and i mean especially what is it, this is true of all consoles right you, the later you you jump into a console generation you have a ton of great games right. to go back in the library and experience but with the switch like the amount of nintendo first party greatest of all times right is just pretty wild yes you have um uh, super smash brothers ultimate you have you know, Super Mario Odyssey, whether that's your favorite Mario game or not, it is definitely, you know, a um a, a high mark in yes. the Mario series. You have Animal Crossing New Horizons, you have Super uh Mario or you have Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Right. You know, like um th- and that's just like the big heavy evergreen titles that have sold forever, not to mention all the other great games that are in the library. So cup if somebody is picking up a Switch just now for Tears of the Kingdom. You have such so a, much. Uh, you have so, so much. Yeah, so much yeah. to experience. I, and and like so many different like varieties of it too. Like I think about how um like if you jump in uh, on a switch right now and you want to try uh Fire Emblem, you've got like the two different extremes of Fire Emblem. You've got the very like social one that's not very like you know it, you don't have to play it like a hardcore tactics game, and then you've got uh, Engage, which doesn't really have the same social elements, but like is a great tactical game. That's like two representative pillars of Fire Emblem represented on this thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, pretty cool. Over 4 million of those 10 million copies were sold in the Americas, making it the fastest selling Switch game and Nintendo game overall in that territory. And the same is true for Europe, but not Japan. Yeah, Japan being the the spoiler here for uh, this not as far as we can tell, not breaking Nintendo records for uh, first weekend sales. Which I think we know because... Um, uh, Scarlet and Violet. Scarlet and Violet yeah. sold, sold like over $4 billion in Japan in its first three days. Um, and when it did so, the, like, the line from Nintendo was that it broke the record to become the best-selling Nintendo game, or the fastest-selling Nintendo game uh, during the opening weekend. And when uh, these numbers were reported, even though they both are like over 10 million 
um, that it was uh, specified that this is the fastest selling Zelda game. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, par- so it seems like even though uh, the press release that we got after Scarlet and Violets, Pokemon Scarlet and Violets weekend, was that it also sold over 10 million. It seems like uh, it's ha- Scarlet and Violet did sell more than Tears of the Kingdom did. But to put it in perspective, like, um, uh, like the two million plus launch for uh of sales in Japan for Tears of the Kingdom puts it in the echelon of uh like a Monster Hunter or a Dragon Quest, right? In that co- a phenomenon in that country yeah. versus before, like, um, I don't think Z- I think Zelda games maybe topped out at 2 million in yeah. that t- in Japan. So, um yeah, Tears of the Kingdom Breath of the Wild just doing like crazy things for the Zelda series. Plus you have like the $70 price, you know, tagged well, so, for the first time in yes. North America. I I was wondering about this earlier and I uh, voiced this a little bit on the Discord, but like what do you think the average consumer's financial experience of Breath of the Wild is? Is it just cuz I, I bought it with a voucher, right? Which means I spent $100, but I got two games. So we'll just say that that's 50 Then I bought the Amiibo. That's another $16. So that's up to $66. And then I brought the Pro Controller. That's another $70. So, like, I my financial experience of this game was, like, $130. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not the top end, and I'm not the bottom end. Do I represent something in the middle? I would, I, I would guess that for the, the like... Yeah, that would actually be super, super interesting to know. I would guess that the majority just bought the just game. Just bought the game and they didn't use vouchers because you have to be a Nintendo Switch Online subscriber. Sure. And like, it's, you know, you yes. Gotta factor that into it in, as well. And yes, you're getting two games, you know, for like 50 bucks each, but it's still $100 up front. You know, like it's all those things. Yeah, yeah. So I would guess most people are just buying it like at the store or online and they're just getting it for, you know, the in the US, they're just getting it for the 70 bucks. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the average would be so interesting to know. Do you count? People who bought the uh, the, the switch, spe- the yeah. OLED, yeah, um, and the special edition, special edition too, right? Like, right, yeah. There are a lot of different ways to have spent money on this at at release, and like, if if the average is, and I don't, it probably isn't. If but if the average is a hundred dollars uh, on on this game, it means this game grossed a billion <laughs> during the opening weekend. Yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy stuff. Uh, some other Zelda nuggets from uh, the last week or so. Tears of the Kingdom director Hadamaro Fujibayashi commented on the design for the new Hunky Ganondorf mm-hmm. in an interview with The Verge, which we've seen in trailers, but I have not encountered no, Hunky Ganondorf I. in uh, the game yet. Unless uh, that 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 mummy at the beginning is Ganondorf. <laughs> I don't know if it is. Well, he's not Hunky yet. He's not Hunky yet. No, not mummy shaming, but that's just... Um... We can mummy shame. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but here's uh, the quote from Fujibayashi. Quote, with Ganon, this design really started with Twilight Princess. There's a staffer, Satoru Takizawa, who's been in charge of Ganon's design since Twilight Princess, and Ganon holds a really special place in the staffer's heart. I, uh, what a joy to be the staffer in charge of uh, designing Ganondorf. Right? It, like, it, it means that, like, every time they make a game, they're like, Oh, uh, where's Takizawa? Like he's, he's we we gotta we can't make any Ganon decisions without him. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, of course, there's the understanding that Ganondorf is, of course, the evil antagonist, but he also plays almost as important a role as the main hero, who stands in contrast to each other as part of this legend. So my only request I made was that because he's such an important character at the same level as the protagonist, was to really make him a very cool, very awesome demon king. Pretty, I mean, yeah, make him cool, make him awesome. You can't, Breath of the Wild Link is uh, maybe the first time they really lean into the uh, fact that, like, Link is hot and, like, everyone knows it and can't deal with it. Uh-huh. Um, and I like that they were like, well, so too then must Ganondorf. <laughs> uh, series producer AJ Aonuma commented on the series direction in the post-Breath of the Wild world suggesting that it may be a while before they return to the Ocarina of Time model. And um, in an interview with Game Informer, he said, quote, With Ocarina of Time, I think it's correct to say that it did kind of create a format for a number of titles in the franchise that came after it. But in some ways, there was a little bit of, that was a little bit restricting for us. While we always aimed to give the player freedoms of certain kinds, there were certain things that format didn't really afford in giving people freedom. Of course, the series continued to evolve after Ocarina of Time, but I think it's also fair to say now that we've arrived at Breath of the Wild and the new type of more open play and freedom that it affords. 
Yeah, I think it's correct to say that it has created a new kind of format for the series to proceed from. Uh, cool, great, very happy with that. I, I, I wonder if, cause like you know, if that's if this is another like splintering of the like kind of Zelda that they can make, um, you know, because we've gotten uh like the two D top down kind of Zelda games since they moved into three D, um. It, but like we haven't gotten a new one of those in like a decade, right? Um, when when was a uh, Link Between Worlds? Yeah, probably twenty, probably twenty thirteen or somewhere. Yeah, around it's got to be right. Um, but like I wonder if I wonder when they revisit those, uh, and like on what scale they revisit those. Um, and on top of that, then like the Ocarina of Time likes, uh, will we ever be revisiting that? Right. Or is everything Breath of the Wild now? Yeah, and I, you know, uh, forever is a really long time, mm -hmm. but um, I think it seems likely that the way that in the short term we're going to revisit, you know, the uh, those Ocarina of Time likes is in re-releases of, you know, the HD remasters totally. or, you know, of Ocarina of Time, like that sort of thing. Probably not in new games, unless that's the form that these, like, previously, you know, like, handheld top-down games take in sure. you know, this new form um i i like you said it's it's been since a link between worlds that we've had a new one we had a uh, link's awakening in 2019 and i'm hopeful that i felt like the great promise of the switch that there is one area that i think has not um lived up to my personal like hopes and dreams for the system is that those um smaller like handheld titles totally the would continue to live on and, but be available on the Switch. And that is like kind of happened. You know, you got like Metroid Dread and stuff like that. But I feel like what we're seeing is that everything has, many things feel like they have to be on like a grand scale. Where, yeah. at, you know, like a, an HD $60, $70 game scale. Whereas like, I wouldn't mind if they were still putting out games that were um, like. A link between worlds, but I guess you can't get away with the, the graphics, you know, anymore. Yeah, I mean that's that that's but... the tough thing is that like the the resolution is so low on the uh, DS and 3DS screen that like yeah, you just you just can't get get away with that anymore. But I mean like yeah, I, I the example even of a link between worlds isn't really fair because that game is also pretty wide open, right? Like yeah, to it, a, yeah, it, yeah. It, it it takes uh it is sort of like the the uh, training wheels for breath of the wild in, in some ways um you can approach the dungeons in whatever order you want um but yeah i don't know i i i love the zelda series it's so exciting to uh like see it uh active and popping and like really being great yeah but yes uh, i i think what you're driving at and what i agree with is like i hope that there are there's still room for the like uh b zelda titles you know like not like the b tier Still great, but just kind of like those like minor Zelda releases. Yeah, sure. But I I do wonder, and obviously they did it with Skyward Sword, so they can't be like overly concerned about it. If there is, you know, this like um, any concern about like confu brand confusion, where it's like Zelda is this huge thing in so many people's minds, right. That it never was before, and so is it confusing to put out something that is so different from that? Um, yeah, I wonder, and, and like I think they just—it's been incredible to see the um, like marketing push behind uh, Tears of the Kingdom in a way that a Zelda game really hasn't been marketed since Breath of the Wild, and really it, it feels like it's on a, an order of magnitude uh, much higher than that. Um, just because Breath of the Wild was also part of the original Switch push, right? So they were advertising that thing a lot, um, but. Uh, like there wasn't the same kind of push behind uh, either Link's Awakening or um, Twilight Prince or uh, sorry Skyward Sword. Um, so like I th I think they just know they can like put those other games out quietly and the Zelda freaks are gonna snatch it up, uh, which I count myself among. Uh huh. Um, and then the people who are you know part of the uh, ravenous fan base of uh, tens of millions. Um, we'll just see the huge ones when they're advertised. Yeah, them. that's true. Uh, a Skyward Sword HD or, you know, like a whatever the next Link's Awakening like, or you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, those top-down Zeldas aren't going to get news stories on the BBC, you know? Right. It'll right. be reserved for those 
the main Zelda releases. That's a good point. Aonuma also commented on Tears of the Kingdom's similarity to Majora's Mask in an interview with Polygon, saying, quote, With Majora's Mask, this is something I didn't really talk about a lot about at the time, but that game is kind of the question of what you do if you had to make a Zelda game in a year. That is me editorializing. That's so funny to me, because that is true. Yeah. It's like their mandate was make a Zelda game in a year. Right. Well, and he goes on to... Sorry, I just want to finish the f- fin- finish this, uh, this uh, paragraph He continues, here. Ocarina of Time took five years, and we were able to use the same ingredients and assets from that to make Ma- Majora's Mask. So five years at that time was a very long development cycle. Um, long, uh, you know, now that seems sort of like standard, but like we were at the very beginning of like the fully 3D games and stuff. Uh, and so a five-year development cycle for Nintendo was I- impossibly long. So the mandate of like get another one of these games out in a year using the same engine was like a financial necessity, right? Like they needed to be able to staple the sales of two games onto the, you know, cost of one development basically. Um and that's that's where this comes from. Um but I I I like what he goes on to say here about uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, so he goes on uh, in some ways, this was kind of an unreasonable challenge for us to even try to take on. But we decided to take the approach of creating a more compact world, which was somewhat self-contained. And there's the system of the three-day cycle that would recur over and over again. And as the player went through that game, they would solve the overarching puzzle that, that kind of was the game. This was definitely a struggle and a challenge to accomplish in one year. And you know, in thinking about Majora's Mask in comparison to Ocarina of Time in that way, the change from Breath of the Wild to Tears of the Kingdom kind of goes in reverse. It was the opposite sort of challenge, in which we took the same world and some of the same materials or constituent parts, but needed to make it all bigger, and needed to create a more expansive world, not just in the horizontal sense, but vertically as well. So that's kind of like what what I want to drill down into, is that they uh, kind of did the Majora's Mask model, but without the mandate of only do this in a year, it took them six, right? Um, And used all the same pieces... Um, but build something so much bigger and so much more expansive than the original game that like, uh, it, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's the kind of thing that you're like, when, when has this ever been done before and when can it ever be replicated again? Yeah. And you know, uh, the kind of what makes my mind real is we talked about the challenge of outdoing Breath of the Wild. Yeah. And by a lot of accounts, you know, Tears of the Kingdom at least matched Breath of the Wild. And now you're the Zelda team. And, and now what do you do? Now what do you do? Um, it's a, uh, It feels even more daunting in my mind than, you know, following up Breath of the Wild. Take him into space. <laughs> Zelda in space. Uh, Anuma concludes. Cross him over with Star Fox. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, uh, Aonuma concludes, I think it's interesting what fans are picking up on. Tears of the Kingdom has a certain somewhat dark atmosphere, and Ganondorf, this prominent antagonist, brings a certain darkness to it as well. But I think because of the reasons I mentioned, that these were two very different challenges and that they don't have that direct relationship. So uh, he says, no, Majora's Mask, not a good point of comparison for Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, Nintendo also had an investor's Q&A this week. They released their financial results uh, for the fiscal year. Um, but here are some highlights from the, the investor Q&A and uh, Nintendo president Furukawa's responses. Um, and I, I, we're just paraphrasing all of these, not take, yeah. taking direct quotes. So just some bullet points. The early announcement of the Nintendo Switch revealed as the NX a full two years before like the Switch was released. It was a special case. It was he considers it an anom- anomaly that they needed to do because if they were going to announce, they were announcing their entry into mobile games, and they needed they wanted to make clear they needed to make clear that they weren't abandoning their traditional hardware strategy. So yeah. that's why they um, announced the NX as early as they did. And also, he- as soon as you can tell people uh, there is relief from the Wii U, I think probably <laughs> the better. <laughs> And so uh, Furukawa believes that future hardware would not necessarily be announced or revealed in the same way or the same cadence. and uh, Which makes sense. I, I am starting to think that whatever the next Switch is, comes out in 2025, uh, that uh, it'll, it'll be like a really quick cycle and they won't 
they won't really be teasing it. It'll just be like, uh, you know, I mean, probably on the same uh, same cadence of like uh, revealed in November and then released in like February or March again, or you know, so another like uh, abbreviated timeline of like four months. Yeah, I mean, but that, yeah. without the without the two years before it, of, right? Like, where you the code name coming. was like losing looming yeah. out there. Um. Uh, also reiterated that right now there's no plans for a Switch price cut and that uh, Tears of the Kingdom $70 price tag in North America is not necessarily indicative of a general inc- increase for Switch ho- software, just reiterating what uh, the we had heard previously. Mm-hmm. And then um, talking about the success of the Super Mario Brothers movie, said, quote, the movie inspires interest in Mario games and has a positive effect on sales of Nintendo Switch hardware and software over the medium to long term. Okay, first of all, he's answering questions about uh, the previous financial year, right? Did not include the release of the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I I think, if I'm remembering right, the question was about kind of... Uh, um, uh, no, I can't remember. But I, I, think, it was, I think it was more forward-looking, being like, how yeah. do you see... You know, like uh, the Super Mario Brothers movie affecting this year's earnings or... Because, yeah. you know, th- I think they set a fairly ambitious goal for number of Switches sold in the next fiscal year. And in the same Q&A, he says that it's ambitious and we're not entirely sure that we're going to be able to match it. Yeah, well, it's just uh, him him saying uh, that uh, the Inspire's interest in the Mario games and has a positive effect on sales of Nintendo Switch hardware and software over the medium to long term. Um, I want... I just the the Super Mario Brothers movie the uh, success of it. I want to see what the effect of that is on the the gaming side. Um, I'm just incredibly curious, like how many people did this drive to uh, buy games and buy Switches? Um, is it any? I I I like genuinely have no concept. He says it does have a positive effect over the medium and long term. They 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 haven't had long term uh, data or medium term data at this point. Yeah, only incredibly short term data. Um, so I think he there may be a little wish casting there. Um, but I'm I'm very interested to see when we actually do get sort of information about switch sales numbers from this period. He also mentioned plans for a quote variety of visual content based on Nintendo <laughs> IP in the future, which uh, he specifically called out, what was that called? Like Nintendo Pictures? Yeah. That um, subsidiary that we talked about a few months ago where they bought a, or like acquired or did something with a company that primarily was known for making cutscenes and right. like, uh, for video games. And so, but interesting that he specifically called that out as uh, part of the answer on a, a visual content that they're going to create. Um, and there's been like, r- you know, rumors of stuff uh, that like other uh, like shows for Netflix or whatever. And I know there was a uh, uh, an interview with A.G. Numa where he was expressing an interest in a Zelda series. Um, that always makes me a little bit nervous. I mean, the Mario movie made me nervous, too. Right. Um, and uh, we ended up not liking it. We ended up not liking it. Um, so like. I don't know. Do you want to see a Zelda series? I mean, not if Illumination oh, is involved. I mean, definitely not if Illumination <laughs> is involved. Holy cow! What what can at this point? What would you be like? Okay, Illumination, you can do. You can take this Nintendo property and do that. Um, I I just don't think those mo- their movies are to my taste. Yeah, yeah, same. Um, so yeah, I don't know that there is. I one. just keep your ice hands climbers. Off. Ice climbers, fine. I was just gonna say, keep your hands off Rusty. <laughs> if there's a Rusty Slugger Illumination Nintendo movie, think of all the needle drops that could exist for you. Ain't nothing but a hound dog. Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll have to get some like they'll get like Tame Impala to a dance remix. Okay, of, uh, I, I mean I kind of want that. Now. <laughs> yeah, take me out to the ball game. That'd be amazing. Uh, finally, Pac Man '99 is uh joining the big 99 in the sky sure i mean the previous uh, occupants in the sky is just super mario brothers 35 that's right not a 99 but a 35 Uh uh-huh um but yes pac-man 99 a game i forgot existed and was available to me is um how dare you (laughs) we'll, we'll be we'll be shutting down it was a nintendo switch online exclusive and uh, it'll be shutting down later this year. On October 8th, the game will be delisted from the service, and the servers will be shut down. Players that downloaded the tile before October 8th will still have access to offline modes, uh, like CPU battle, 
but otherwise the game is disappearing it just ceases to exist uh which is a you know just feature of living in uh this era that games can simply cease to be yeah i guess it's nice that i mean and there's no reason for them not to do it but that you can still play in offline mode mm -hmm. um but it, I, it must be lightly used if you know it's an add-on to nintendo switch online and uh yeah i would think you know, it's not worth lightly used. keeping going um i mean it's yeah, bandai namco tried to monetize this thing in a lot of different ways um like this sold like tons and tons of different like themes on on top of um, you know, just like the, the the base game. So like there was a way to spend money on this thing. Um, but like you know, we get excited every time there's a, a new uh, Tetris ninety nine theme. Partially that's because we like Tetris, but also because the themes are largely uh like Nintendo products, right? Or Nintendo uh graphics. Um and like you know, I don't want like a dig dug theme for <laughs> uh, for Pac Man, and that's like the least obscure uh, uh, Bandai Namco property that they made themes of. Like there were all these things where it's just like I don't know what that is. Like I'll believe you that that's a video game, but I don't know what these things are. Yeah, yeah. It was a, you know it never really clicked for me in the same way that Tetris ninety nine or even Super Mario thirty five did. Uh, I hope they don't abandon this entirely. I think you could still make some interesting 99 games or something yeah. in that vein. But, um, well, uh, so that raises the question, do you think they replace this with like another 99 game or just we start losing stuff on the service? I think maybe you lose stuff on the service. Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess they have added stuff for just base subscribers. So, you know, Tetris 99 yeah. and... Pac-Man 99 were just included in a base subscription, but they've added Game Boy games and Game Boy... No. Just well, Game Boy games? Well, and, and Game Boy Color. Yeah, but, yeah, like Game Boy Color games. Oh, right. Game Boy Advance is exclusive to Plus Expansion Pack. So, um, yeah, I, I, of course, hope that they continue to add new features to Nintendo Switch Online. Uh, but for me personally, that Pac-Man 99 is going away I what does not feel like I'm losing value necessarily. I wonder if uh this if uh Pac-Man 99 ends up showing up somewhere else. Oh, like if uh Bandai Namco is just like okay, now it's on like everything and you mm -hmm. just have to buy it, you know? Um cuz like part of what it needs is a, a an active player base. And right. I don't know that there is a world where there's an active player base for the game, but like not being tethered to the Switch, not being tethered to uh, people who subscribe to the Nintendo Switch Online, it's a pretty good start. Yeah. Um, like, if you could put it on phones uh, and, you know, uh, computers and everything, like, I, I think that there's a possibility for a second life with this thing. Yeah, totally. Um, I don't want to have to ask this question, but what does this mean for Tetris 99? Is Tetris 99 ever going away? Uh um forever I, is a long time <laughs> yeah I, I i in the foreseeable future i'd be surprised i feel like tetris 99 uh just seems like something that is popular enough yeah that um i i think it did capture the imagination and there are people playing it uh it's a great way to play tetris you know yeah, yeah. uh and like i feel like tetris is improved by the 99 gameplay whereas i don't think that um pac-man Pac is kind of confusing it's just very confusing yeah and it gets too loud <laughs> <laughs> both visually and sound wise uh all right mark let's get out of the news all right that is going to do it for this episode of nintendo cartridge society thank you so much to our 16-bit patron connor mccabe we appreciate you connor um Join our Discord, email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail uh, and we will send you an invitation. Anthony DeLuca made our logo. Our theme music is provided by 8 Betty. You can get more of his music by going to 8BitBetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers saying thank you for listening.